Now, you're in for a great treat tonight, by the way. Charlie, it's all yours. Take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Phil. And thanks, everyone, for being here. This is a terrific turnout this evening. All right. Um, we're, we call this uh, Rev Up. We call it that just because Steve Middle at the University of Oregon, who started this program a few years ago, uh, picked that name. And, and uh, it, it seems to work. It conveys that something exciting, that electric vehicles are exciting and happening. And uh, speaking of Steve and University of Oregon, we are doing this on behalf of a lot of partner organizations, City of Eugene, City of Springfield, City of Ashland, Lane County, uh, most of our local utilities, uh, the Lane Regional Air Protection Agency, right. Better Eugene Springfield Transportation, all of these groups have a real interest in promoting uh, transition to electric vehicles, and we're happy to be able to provide some information to those who are curious about vehicles and uh, are curious about EVs and want to find out more. So tonight, we are going to talk about the following topics, um, and then we can talk about other topics if you have questions about them at the end. We're going to talk about why go electric, the benefits of electric vehicles, the differences between ICE and electric vehicles. I'm going to use that acronym some, ICE. It just means internal combustion engine. It's our conventional gas and diesel powered cars. If you hear me say ICE, I'm just referring to the kind of car you're used to. Uh, we'll talk about cost considerations of going electric. We'll talk about things that may make you nervous, including the range of these vehicles, how you get them charged up, and uh, lots of questions about those batteries. We'll talk about things that save you money when it comes to electric vehicles, and then, of course, uh, save a lot of time for questions and answers. Now, I want to narrow the field a little bit because the term electric vehicle actually encompasses several different kinds of vehicles. And this diagram roughly shows what those are. Starting at the far left, the hybrid electric vehicle. Um, this is a car that is mostly a gas powered car, uh, has an internal combustion engine that primarily drives the car, but it does have an electric motor too that assists and a battery that's charged mostly by regenerative braking. Um, this is the kind of car that our classic Toyota Prius, at least here in Eugene, uh, Toyota Prius is ubiquitous around town, and um, this is a hybrid electric vehicle. A step toward further electrification is the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Much like a hybrid, um, has both an electric motor and an ICE motor, still runs mainly on uh, gas or diesel, but has a bigger battery and you can actually charge that battery by plugging it into a wall outlet. Um, and then the cars typically have a certain amount of all electric range, usually in the high teens, mid to upper 20s. There's at least one that gets over 30. The Chevrolet uh, Volt, which is no longer available as a new car, though there are used ones available. Actually, we get over 50 miles of all electric range uh, before switching over to that gas powered engine. But we are going to spend most of our time this evening talking about the third item in this diagram, the battery electric vehicle. Um, here, there is no gas tank. There is no internal combustion engine. There's a big battery. You plug it in to charge it and you run entirely off an electric motor. We're going to spend most of our time talking about this one because the uh, previous two, the hybrids, uh, those in the end can often work just like a car that you're used to. It's when we get to this fully battery electric vehicle that people start getting nervous and have a lot of questions. And those are the kind of questions we're going to try to address tonight. I will give an honorary mention to the last diagram, uh, the, the car illustrated by the last diagram, the fuel cell electric vehicle. Um, this also runs on an electric motor, um, but the electric current in this case is produced from hydrogen being passed through a fuel cell, combining the hydrogen with oxygen, releasing an electric current and some water vapor. Um, I'm not going to talk about these cars because they aren't available here in Oregon, and there's no hydrogen fueling infrastructure here, so we don't really see these coming here at any time. Really, the only place in the U.S. they're available in very small amounts is Southern California. All right, so the kinds of electric vehicles we're talking about are about passenger vehicles, cars like the Tesla, the Chevrolet Bolt, the Nissan Leaf, the Hyundai Kona EV version. They have gas powered versions too. Uh, the uh, newly released this year, the VW ID4, 
uh, also newly released this year, the Rivian pickup truck and the much anticipated future kinds of passenger cars like the Volkswagen ID Buzz. There are many other passenger vehicles, increasing numbers of passenger vehicles out there. Uh, but this is an example of what we're hoping to talk about tonight. There is another class of electric vehicles you should be aware of just because they might serve your transportation needs. Increasingly, uh, uh, we were talking earlier to Lefty about electric bikes, um, his preferred mode of transportation around Eugene. There are also electric scooters, segways, one wheels, and our locally manufactured motorcycle class vehicles, Arkimoto's. Any of these vehicles may serve your needs and are worth investigating. I don't have time to talk about them tonight. We are going to focus entirely on passenger vehicles, the cars and trucks and SUVs. Let's talk a little bit to start with about the benefits of electric vehicles and something that is most in the news today, carbon. Let's talk about carbon. Um, the city of Eugene, uh, as an example, did an analysis looking at sources of carbon emissions citywide. Uh, this is back in 2017 and projecting out to 2030. And what they discovered is that 53% of carbon emissions are from transportation, uh, remaining similar throughout the, the period. Um, and this is not, this is definitely reflected in all the communities for folks who are likely to be on this call. Um, Lane County in a more recent estimate discovered that about 66% of greenhouse gas emissions countywide are from, um, from the transportation sector. So if you want to make a personal difference in the amount of carbon that you're emitting into the atmosphere, um, doing something about your transportation is the, mo the best way to go. It's where you can have the most impact. And moving from an uh, internal combustion engine vehicle to an EV is the best way to do that. Um, and that's particularly true here because so much of our uh, electricity in the Pacific Northwest generally in Eugene, Springfield, greater Willamette Valley area, out on the coast comes from hydroelectric power, which is uh, does not have, once it's built, does not have a carbon impact. Um, so uh, making that transition from uh, fossil fuel, a fossil fuel powered car to an electric vehicle would make a big difference in your personal carbon footprint. EWEB has actually done, Eugene Water Electric Board has done analysis showing that each new EV that replaces an internal combustion engine in EWEB service territory translates to a two and three quarter metric ton reduction in annual carbon emissions. But really it's true nationwide that if you switch to an EV, you're going to cut your carbon footprint. Um, this map shows the miles per gallon your gas powered car would have to get in order to emit uh, fewer emissions than the comparable EV or than the average EV. And looking around the country, you can see that here in the Pacific Northwest, you'd have to have a car that goes 100 and gets 102 miles per gallon in order to have a better carbon emission profile. Actually, I think here in the Eugene Springfield area in Lane County generally, would, it's probably even more than that. Really, it's only in the Midwest, in Michigan uh, and Wisconsin, where gas-powered cars can even compete. And even then, you have to have a pretty dang efficient car in order to be competitive with an EV in terms of reducing your carbon footprint. There are many environmental benefits besides just the carbon emissions, however. There's a lot of other environmental concerns associated with the oil industry uh, uh, and, and burning fuel in, in cars and trucks. There's toxic waste involved in the production of oil and gas. There are oil spills involved in transportation, one in, down in Southern California not very long ago. Um, there's air and water pollution associated with refining. There's noise pollution from all those little explosions going off in everyone's car engines. Um, there are human rights concerns in many of the countries where oil is produced and their tailpipe emissions. This one to me is actually right up there with carbon emissions in terms of the damage, the, um, uh, the pollutants, the particulates, the nitrogen oxides, the volatile organic compounds that come out of tailpipes 
um, create a tremendous amount of air pollution in our cities. Um, according to a report from the American Lung Association, the widespread transition to zero emission transportation technologies could produce emission reductions in 2050. We could add up to $72 billion in avoided health harm, saving approximately 6,300 lives and avoiding more than 93,000 asthma attacks in 416,000 lost workdays annually due to significant reductions in transportation related pollution. Now, um, that's not to say there aren't some concerns associated with battery electric vehicles as well. Yes, there's toxic waste involved in production of the uh, essential minerals that go into batteries. There's air and water pollution from electricity production in many places. There are issues with battery disposal and there are human rights concerns associated with mining some of these minerals. But I think when you put these two lists next to each other and, um, and I, can't, I don't have the time to do a comprehensive evaluation, you'd have to say, man, the battery electric vehicles are often looking a lot better than their conventional counterparts. The benefits of electric vehicles go beyond uh, the environmental. There's drive quality. For instance, electric vehicles are very, very quiet. In fact, they have to add noise at low speeds so to avoid surprising unwary or uh, sight impaired pedestrians. Um, electric cars have instant torque and really fast acceleration. They're very zippy and fun to drive. They only have one gear, so there are no gear shifts. Um, they also have a very smooth and low vibration drive. They are just pleasant. They are a joy to drive. They're also lots more efficient than their conventional counter, uh, counterparts. Uh, when you put gas into the tank of, uh, of a regular ICE car, by the time it gets to actually making your car go, you've lost an awful lot of that energy that's embodied in that gasoline. Much of it just going away is heat. Um, and then being used up by other car systems. By the time it gets to your wheels, only 16 to 25% of that energy you put into your tank actually makes your car move. By contrast, for an electric vehicle, the power to the wheels is 69 to 73% of what of the electricity that you put into the car actually helps make the car go. And because of regenerative braking, recovering power as you uh, slow the car down, you can recover up to 17% more, meaning that these cars are 86 to 90% efficient. You're using most of the energy you put into the car to actually make the car go. I didn't use that picture. There's one guy who's oh, gawking. Like I, hear a, <laughs> I hear some background noise. Can everyone please make sure your microphones are muted? I don't think you want us to be listening to what's going on in your house. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, you can see that at great uh, that excellent efficiency reflected in uh, the miles per gallon electric. This is the equivalent miles per gallon that um, you get dry uh, that, that, that as you is used to show how efficient electric cars are. They can you can get an establish an equivalency by just looking at some common unit of measurement. A gallon of gas is about 114,000 British thermal units, a kilowatt hour is about 3,400 uh, uh, BTUs. And so a gallon of gas is worth about 33.7 kilowatt hours. And then looking at how those get used in a car, you can establish a mile per gallon equivalent for electric cars. And uh, again, this isn't somehow the amount of uh, of, of actual fuel you're using somewhere out in the distance. It's just the amount of energy, the equivalent amount of energy. So um, you can see that, um, that electric cars, such as the Tesla Model 3, all the way down through the larger Volkswagen ID4, uh, get considerable or more range than even an energy efficient conventional car like a Honda Civic, which might get 30, be rated for 33 miles per gallon. Even the um, SUV size Volkswagen, uh, ID4 gets three times that amount of efficiency in terms of um, its use of energy. There's some other benefits of electric vehicles too. The simplicity and maintenance uh, are, are high among those. The ongoing maintenance of electric vehicles is quite small because the electric 
drivetrains are so much simpler. Uh, ongoing maintenance may it, uh, usually just includes wiper blades, wiper fluid, cabin, changing the cabin air filter, making sure your tires are rotated and keeping an eye on the tread. There is some coolant associated with it and then some uh, changing out brake pads, although brake pads wear very, very slowly uh, because you mostly slow down using regenerative braking and which don't wear on the, the brake pads. Meanwhile, you can get rid of a whole lot of both short-term and long-term maintenance that you're used to doing on conventional cars. There's no air filter, no fuel filter, no oil or oil filter on EVs. You get rid of the fuel injectors and pumps, the spark plugs, the alternator, power steering fluid, radiator and hoses, all the belts, the water pump. None of these exist in an electric car. So you don't have to worry about that maintenance anymore. So as you might guess between um, higher fuel efficiency and lower maintenance costs, your operating costs for an electric vehicle are quite a bit lower than for an ICE vehicle. Um, EWEB estimates, uh, well, you can see from the graph, EWEB estimates that it costs less than a third in terms of fuel to power your car a similar distance. And there are, these estimates were actually produced for a car getting 25 miles per gallon at 275 uh, per gallon uh, cost, uh, 275 uh, cost uh, per gallon of gas. So things are actually a little worse than that right now. Um, meanwhile, Consumer Reports has noted in their survey of car owners that the maintenance cost for electric vehicles run at about 50% of what it does for a conventional car. Of course, we're not only concerned if you're shopping for a new car about operating costs, there's also the purchase price. And you know, you've probably heard that electric vehicles are more expensive to buy than a comparable conventional car. But um, there are ways of comparing what's called the total cost of ownership. How much is it gonna cost me to own this whole car over the course of the time that I have it? Um, the U.S. Department of Energy provides this hand, handy calculator that you can use. And for the sake of example, I'm going to look at the same car in both the electric vehicle and gas-powered versions, the Hyundai Kona. Um, the calculator lets you plug in how you use the car, um, including uh, your driving daily driving distance, percentage highway versus city and so forth. I'm plugging in about 12,000 miles here half highway, half city. And then it produces a graph showing you what your total cost of ownership will be. And as you can see, the higher purchase price of the Kona electric EV makes it more expensive in early years, but that cost narrows over time until after 15 years, the total cost of ownership is about the same. But I actually left off one thing here. I did not include the tax credits and rebates that are available for the Kona EV compared to its conventional counterpart. When I put that in, the costs are actually roughly the same, even from the get-go, but the EV is cheaper after year seven. Um, don't worry too much about jotting down uh, this website. I will be sending out a follow-up email that will have this and other resources that you will find useful uh, in an email after the program. All right, let's talk about things that may make you nervous about going electric for your transportation. And we'll start with range and range anxiety. I think that's the first question we often get about electric cars is how far will it go before the battery runs out? And certainly uh, five, 10 years ago, you'd see a lot of electric vehicles that might only get 80 or 100 miles of range, but that's changed a lot. Here are some examples from the 2021 model year of a variety of popular electric vehicles, starting at the low end, the basic Nissan Leaf at 149 miles of range on a full charge, but going all the way up to the Tesla Model 3 long range, which gets over 350. Um, we seem to be this year clustering in the mid 200s, 250 or so miles. Um, is kind of typical for uh, an EV of the 2021 vintage. Um, but there's an important question you should ask when you're thinking about range. And it's very simply, how will you use the car? Because it could be depending on what your needs are, you may not need that as much range. Um, so for example, this is my first electric vehicle, a Chevrolet Spark. We leased this in 2016. And it's one of those cars that has an 80 mile range. Um, it's not made anymore, but there are used ones on the market. Um, and 
it was fine. We, they, we bought this or leased it specifically to be an in-town car. It, it never went any further than Coburg or Cottage Grove uh, from Eugene, where I live. And, um, and we could bring it home and charge it overnight and it was fine to go the next day. Uh, it was perfect for the need because we had a second car that was a conventional Toyota Prius that we um, used for doing out of town trips. When the lease was up in 2019, uh, the ranges of electric cars had increased quite a lot. We decided that we would try to get by with bikes in a single car and just got one electric vehicle that could do everything and has one, one of the longer range vehicles. Um, so establishing what your need is, is important. Of course, no matter what your range is, eventually you will need to charge it. Um, and the good news about electric vehicles is that some of the, most of that charging is going to take place at home. Really, I should have listed this as a benefit of EVs because it is so convenient just to be able to get home, bring your car home, plug it in, and let that be your refueling. Um, Really, electric cars will arrive to you ready to just plug into a conventional household outlet. Yes, you can plug it into your standard 120 volt outlet. Unfortunately, it won't charge it very fast. It add about four miles of range per hour of charging. Now, if you're only driving your car 30 miles a day and coming home, that's not a big deal. You can plug it in, it'll be fully charged by the next morning. If on the other hand, you have a car that has a range of 250 miles and you're regularly running that down to close to empty, well, you can do the math. 250 divided by four is going to be a very slow charge, but there is a solution to that. Um, you can install as an electric vehicle supply equipment, an EVSE, which charges at a much higher voltage, 240 volts. So similar to an electric clothes dryer, say. Um, these chargers can add, um, operate between 3.6 and 20 kilowatts and uh, typical is about 7.2 and can add 25 miles per range uh, uh, of range per hour that they are plugged in. So this enables those cars in the mid 200s to easily get charged up overnight. Um, in addition to being charging at home, you have the option often to charge in your community. So lots of places these days are putting in uh, charging opportunities for you, whether you're at Lane Community College and their big solar powered canopy there that provides uh, uh, charging for folks who are parked out at LCC, or if you're in downtown Springfield, you can pull into the Larapa office and plug in. Uh, workplaces, schools, parks, libraries, and restaurants may all have the opportunity to charge while you shop, work, or dine. I've seen equipment installed in locations as varied as the Eugene Public Library parking garage and the King Estate parking lot. Um, they are around. How do you find them, though? If you uh, Are there big signs? Um, often not, but like with many things these days, there is an app for that. And this is a screenshot from one of those most popular apps called PlugShare. And PlugShare will show you where all the charging locations are in, um, in the area where you are, wherever you need to find charging locations. You can move the map around the country and highlight wherever in particular that you want to go. Um, it will, uh, if you click on one of these tabs that shows where a charging station is, it will pull up information on the left side of the screen or on your phone that will tell you what kind of charging is available there, whether you have to pay for it, uh, whether there's, a, whether it's in a pay parking lot. If the charging unit's uh, actually hooked to a network, it'll even tell you whether someone's actively charging there right now. So you'll know whether that spot's available if you show up to charge. There are other apps too. Uh, they all have different strengths. Um, PlugShare is nice because it uh, often, it, 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 it tends to be the consolidator. It has just about everything there is out there. Now, there is the question if you are traveling. So even if you, even those level two chargers aren't likely to do it. If you've got 500 miles to go and you've got a car with 250 mile range, Somewhere during that day, um, you will need to stop and charge, but there's a solution to that too, DC fast charging. Um, this is the most similar kind of charging to pulling up to a gas station and filling your conventional cast tank with, uh, with fuel. Um, 
The speed on these um, is much, much higher than even the level two chargers, ranging from 50 to 350 kilowatts. Um, most cars are kind of sizing the ability to accept charge so they can get uh, up to 80% charge in less than an hour. Actually, I often see 80% charge in 30 or 40 minutes um, if hooked to a DC fast charger. Um, this is what you use when you are traveling. Now, there are some additional challenges to do DC fast charging, one of which is that the connectors aren't standardized. So there are three different kinds. Um, the CCS is the North American and European standard. Chatamo is more East Asian, Japanese in particular. Um, Tesla has their own. Uh, the good news about this is that, well, I guess two things. One, Tesla operates their own network uh, their own charging network. And if you have a Tesla, you will get used to looking for just where those Tesla charging stations are and they will take care of you. It's actually the most robust charging network in the country. Um, all the newer stations uh, uh, for CCS and Chatamo usually offer both. Um, so that if you pull up, it would be like going to a gas station where you have a choice between um, uh, standard and diesel, you know, and you just pick pick the right one. There are older stations um, in Oregon that may just have Chatamo. Um, the standard is kind of converging now towards CCS, and sometime in the distant future, 20 or 30 years out, it may all be CCS, but there are an awful lot of Nissan Leafs running around that need the Chatamo, and they're, they're going to be providing opportunities to charge for them for a while. Um, now, all DC fast chargers are expensive to put in, and there are dedicated companies operating charging networks that tend to install these. Companies like Electrify America or Blink or Evgo, and then Tesla, as I mentioned, operates their own. Um, and uh, they have usually have their own apps to make it easy to interact with their stations. Many of them provide the opportunity just to plug in a credit card like you would at a gas pump to charge your car. Now, one last thought on charging. One of my collaborators on this project made a very good point to me, noting that EV charging is something you worry about a lot before you buy an electric car and hardly at all afterwards. Uh, we all kind of quickly adapt to the rhythm of charging the car, whether at home or on the road. Our habits change a little, and then it's just normal to plug in your car at home when you notice the gauge is looking a little low, and or you think about planning a lunch break uh, around a DC fast charger when you're in the middle of a day's journey. This new way of fueling, it's uh, better and more convenient in some ways, particularly charging at home, which just saves a ton of time and energy. But it's a little less convenient than others, like charging uh, while traveling. But in the end, it's really just a matter of uh, adapting your habits a little bit. Other things that may make you nervous, batteries. There are a lot of questions that come up around batteries, like safety. Will my batteries catch on fire? Uh, there have been some media reports, uh, uh, spectacular media reports about this. And then Chevrolet had to recall all of their Chevrolet bolts because of uh, defective batteries that were uh, on rare occasion catching on fire, but not rare enough to avoid a full recall. Um, you know, it's... Uh, there's no evidence that this is more that the batteries are more of a hazard in EVs than they than driving a, a, around on a tank of explosive fuel is in a conventional car. We're all used to that and don't think twice about it. Um, I, I think there's more media scrutiny on the new technology and. When you look at data, it doesn't look like electric cars are having any more issues um, overall than their conventional counter counterparts. So this is data from the Highway Loss Data Institute um, looking at insurance losses from electric vehicles and their conventional counterparts. And in fact, in terms of claim frequency and overall losses, really electric cars are far superior to their conventional counterparts. A tiny bit of uh, uh, difference in claim severity, but even that has been narrowing in recent years. Um, so in terms of the Data, you know, here's one hard piece of data that would indicate that your um, electric car is no more likely to blow up than your conventional car. Another question, longevity, how long will those batteries last? We're all, uh, many of us have used rechargeable batteries for one kind of appliance or, or another and are used to those rechargeable batteries declining in oomph over time. Um, and that happens with electric vehicles too, but it does happen quite slowly. 
here's a study, the results of a study on Tesla Model S and X's, uh, which look at uh, battery degradation over time. It looks like it was done in Europe, or at least you using metric measurements. So it gets out to 250,000 kilometers worth of driving or about 150,000 miles on the right end of the graph. And you see that while um, the battery level, the, uh, uh, the 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 yeah, stripping over my tongue here. Well, there is some battery degradation. Um, it's not very much, and it's quite gradual um, over time. And that, generally speaking, you still have most of your battery oomph left after even 150,000 miles. Now, there is an outlier here. Uh, one car that dropped its batteries dropped to 75% of capacity in just a few kilometers, but that would be a defective battery and it would be covered under warranty. In fact, every car manufacturer selling in the US warranties their batteries for at least eight years and 100,000 miles, some longer. Um, so uh, yes, it is an issue and yes, batteries will eventually wear out, but they're pretty much designed to last as long as the car does with some loss in and uh, ability to charge. Finally, recycling. What happens to those expired EV batteries when they finally do wear out? And I would have to say this is a bit of a work in progress. There are a lot of really smart people in big businesses working to make battery recycling happen. And um, right now, I, there's so few car EVs that have been around long enough for their batteries to, uh, to run down. That there really aren't too many right now to work with. But those that have come up uh, have expired. Um, they've generally found are still useful for stationary applications, even when they're no longer useful for mobile applications. So they may have just been harvested and are off serving as a backup power for a building somewhere uh, rather than running a car. But there are a lot of valuable minerals in those batteries and metal, minerals and metals. And there's a lot of work going on into figuring out how to extract those so that they can be recycled and put back into new batteries. Work in progress, not yet fully solved. So can we reduce your nervousness about getting into an electric car? Figure out how you'll use your car, where you want to go. Um, look at uh, the range, uh, figure out a range that works for you. Um, check to see how, what that level two, on, I, I didn't actually, I didn't go into details on this, level two onboard charger capacity, that level two charger that you can install at home, your car, the charger is actually in your car, that piece of equipment on the wall just supplies the energy and talks to your charger to be able to deliver the optimal amount. Find out how much charge you can get through that level two charger in your car, how many miles you can add uh, per hour of charging. Uh, pay attention to that DC fast charge connector um, so that you know what, which one you're getting and where, what kind of fast chargers you'll need to use. And then look at that DC fast charge capability. Uh, how, what's the biggest wattage I can uh, take when plugging into a fast charger? Um, you'll find that uh, chargers are built, the DC fast chargers themselves are built at different wattages. So you may pull up to one that can only deliver 50 kilowatts while your car can take 150, in which case it will charge more slowly than it could be. While if you use your apps to find one that actually is matched to your car, then you can really get to that 80% charge within uh, 20, 30, 40 minutes. Let's talk a little bit about things that save you money. And I'll start with financial incentives from the federal government. There is still a $7,500 federal tax credit for the purchase of a new battery electric vehicle or plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. I should say this is up to $7,500 because it diminishes depending on whether it's a fully battery electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid. And then the credit phases out completely after a manu any given a manufacturer sells more than 200,000 cars. So for example, if you were to go invest in a Volkswagen ID4 bat fully battery electric vehicle, you could get qualify for the full tax credit of $7,500. But if you were buying a Toyota Prius Prime, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle that claims about 25 miles of all electric range, 
well, you just get a tax credit of around $4,500. If you buy a Tesla Model 3, you don't qualify for any tax credit uh, from the federal government. Tesla has sold more than 200,000 cars and is phased out of this program. I think they and GM are the only two manufacturers to phase out of this program. Um, it's important to recognize this is a tax credit. So in order to claim it, you have to have actually paid that much in federal taxes. And so when you file your tax, it has to be the same year too. So if you only paid $6,000 in taxes, even if you qualify for $7,500, you will only get $6,000 back. So that's important to keep an eye on if you are counting on this. Um, the federal government, you know, like Congress right now is considering legislation for changing, expanding this, making it not a credit, uh, uh, but more of a full refund of that amount. There's lots of things under discussion. We have no idea whether any of them will actually happen or not. The state of Oregon also provides financial incentives for EVs. Um, $2,500 uh, in a clean vehicle rebate for a new battery electric vehicle, diminishing to $1,500 for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and a $2,500 charge ahead rebate for a new or a used, it's the only one that applies to used, battery electric vehicle or plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So in order to qualify for the charge ahead rebate, you have to meet an income eligibility requirement, um, and uh, which is uh, right now, um, 120% of the median income for the closest MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area, that you could really, you could qualify at, uh, with an annual income of 70, approximately $78,000 in the Eugene Springfield area right now. But it's worth knowing that in this year's legislative session, uh, the legislature modified this program will go in effect next year. You, the maximum rebate will increase to $5,000. And the new income requirement is changing to 400% of the federal poverty level, which means that for a family of two, you could get earn almost $70,000 a year and still qualify for a family of four, up to $106,000. Um, might be worth waiting since we're so close to 2022. If you think you might qualify for this char a revised charge ahead rebate, it can really save you some dollars. I should mention that these two are cumulative. You can actually get right now from, or again, if you qualify for both of these, $5,000 uh, and going up to $7,500 in 2022. Locally, there are often some incentives too. Uh, many of our local utilities offer um, some kind of help or rebates for going electric. EPUD, for example, Emerald People Utility District will give you $100 just for registering your electric vehicle with them. Most of them um, are now offer rebates for installing those that level two charging equipment at home. Worth checking your local utility for those kinds of things. All right. That is the end of my initial long-winded presentation, though I did manage to get through in the time I promised. And now is the time for your questions. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hopefully you've been typing in the chat box. I'm going to let Phil filter the questions for me. And uh, he and I, and um, uh, another member of Emerald Valley Electric Vehicle Association, Mike Brixius, are here to answer all the questions you have. Um, hopefully answer all the questions you have, make our best bet. And we can, if you stump us, we'll find the answer and send it out in a follow-up message to you. Okay. Uh, I've been looking at, uh, this is Phil, I've been looking at some of these questions. Uh, Joan uh, is the first bona fide question uh, which she asked really early on. She said she has 100 and 68 inches of length in her garage and she's limited to what kind of EV they can buy. Uh, what would be the best short electric car? We drive short distances in town and rarely go farther. I, my suggestion is to answer that question might be better to refer her to uh, some websites where she can look up the kind of material for herself rather than trying to guess. <laughs> uh, yes. Any thoughts on that, uh, Charlie or Mike? Um, uh, I will, there, there's, there's one that sounds similar to PlugShare that I'm, I'm spacing the name off right Plugstar? now. PlugStar? But yes, PlugStar has a shopping guide um, that is useful. I don't know whether they'll provide dimensions, but they might. Um, 
you know, other than that, it's often just cruising the different models. And, and obviously you'd be looking at some of the, you know, the ones that have been out, most of the new ones coming out right now are sort of more SUV class or trucks and they're, they're larger. But I think all those, uh, the older ones, like the, that have been around a little while, but are still available, like the Nissan Leafs, the Chevrolet Volts, the Hyundai Konas, uh, the Kia Nero, um, uh, are great. Um, you know, if you're just driving locally and, um, you know, don't, don't need a lot of range, like that Chevrolet Spark, like I put up or an older Nissan Leaf that just has 80 miles of range might do just fine. And they're very small cars and uh, would, would, you know, if you can fit any car in your garage, you could fit a Chevrolet Spark, uh, but they're only available in the used market now. Um, I'll include the plug star information when I send it out, uh, when I send out the follow-up email and, um, hopefully that will help. Mike, do you know of any other good source that consolidates specifications on electric vehicles? Not that I can think of. I was just looking it up. Even the bolt comes in at 164 inches. So that would be really tight. Um, but I would just find smaller cars you're interested in and you just got to Google what the specs are. It changes from year to year. I see that one bolt was 169 and a half inches. Yeah. So one, of the, one of the things to be aware of is that uh, unless your driveway is awfully short, it might make sense to install your electric vehicle charger on the outside of the garage rather than inside it and just park in the driveway. Um, uh, that's another possible solution for somebody with a really, really small garage like that. Um, I should mention Fiat also. Uh, there, there are not many around, but Fiat has a smaller EV too. Right, and the and the um, there's a couple of others that are really small. But I'd suggest looking in, uh, at at and and uh, Charlie, you ought to probably include the the link to Platt Auto for those interested in use. Electric yes, I did just uh, in, uh, in your question. A question at the end of the chat box popped up of asking about used EVs, and there is a dedicated used EV dealership up in Portland called Platt Auto, um, and it's a great place to go just to see a bunch of different models. Uh, you know, there's only there's only a couple of places where you can go and actually see models from different manufacturers, and, and Platt Auto is one of those. Um, and they deal exclusively with used EVs. And so it would be worth checking out if you have the ability to get up to Portland um, to, to look at them. Uh, and as long as I'm on that subject, um, uh, there's a group called Forth that operates an electric vehicle showcase in downtown Portland. Uh, and they always have a few new EV models kicking around that people can take for test drives. And again, somewhere you can go to see several different uh, models from different manufacturers uh, all in one place. Of course, Platt also has a website that will put material information up very similar to what you get in Plug in uh, Plugstar uh, for used for the used cars that they have in stock. So it's worth looking there before you drive to Portland. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, um, what do you know about the startups to mine the ocean floor for metals using uh, used in making electric batteries or other mining efforts? Um, and that Nancy also continued her question a little later. She says she wants an EV, but just want to make sure we aren't creating more problems, especially for our oceans, in trying to eliminate ice vehicles. So, uh, Charlie, that may be your cue to talk about the trade offs between uh, manufacturing and actual use, uh, comparing ice vehicles, uh, in, in, internal combustion engine vehicles, and EVs. Uh, do you want to talk about that or should I do that? Um, I, I'll just say one thing and then I'll let you say, and then I'll let you take over, Phil. And, and, and the thing that I would say is that trying to maintain our middle upper class American lifestyle has environmental impacts. It requires materials and metals. And, um, and the question really is how can we minimize that? Um, you know, certainly what I hear about in terms of, um, uh, extraction to support batteries, for instance, lithium extraction right now is all focused onshore. Uh, and, and anywhere you try to site one immediately has controversies. There's one down there, people camped out at a proposed mine site on the Nevada, Oregon border uh, uh, right now protesting a lithium mine that's proposed for that area. 
Um, you know, there's no, uh, there's, if we want to drive cars, we're going to have an impact and it's a question of finding what the least impact will be. And, and that's my cue to add that by the time you burn fossil fuels in your internal combustion engine car for a few months, you have more than made up uh, the, 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 the small additional carbon emissions or pollution related to the, de the development and, and building of electric uh, vehicle batteries, uh, which is the ba basic difference between the two. So uh, uh, are EVs entirely clean? No. But are they a whole lot better than internal combustion engine vehicles? Absolutely. much. And of course, uh, Charlie hit that issue pretty good at the beginning of his presentation in talking about carbon emissions in our area. The other thing I would say is that you start with the industry you had. When uh, the first steam engines came along, they were built by blacksmiths because that's what we that's what they had in England where they where they started building uh, steam engines. What about two hundred and thirty years ago? Um, right now, what we've got in mines is we have these gigantic diesel vehicles that are that operate uh, the mine and they use a lot of diesel fuel. All of those will soon be electrified for the very simple reason that maintenance and, and fuel costs are vastly lower for electric, gigantic, big mining rigs than a diesel is. As that happens, the, uh, the uh, uh, pollution level of carbon, at least, from mining of anything will decline a lot, and these numbers are going to change dramatically. But Charlie's absolutely right. If you want to maintain... Uh, an American lifestyle, it is going to be very hard to get to zero or to minus, uh, which we, we need to get to minus, of course, for, uh, for uh, pollution. Uh, and it's going to be hard to do that. Is EV the absolute answer for everything? Absolutely not. Uh, electric vehicles are part of the process of getting there. And I, I would certainly encourage anyone who, you know, really wants to hammer on reducing impact, whether it's pollution, carbon emissions or whatever, you know, uh, take the, the, the uh, a cue from Lefty there and, you know, use the bus and ride an electric bike. I mean, really um, talking about electric cars, you're already, you know, having a bigger impact than maybe you have to, depending on your circumstances. Not everyone can ride a bike. The bus doesn't stop everywhere, but um, you know, there are, there are better ways even than an electric car for particularly for local transportation. And, and here's a stumper. Oh, um, Let's, Mike, here's Mike yeah. go, go Mike. I just, I, I think that lithium also tends to be a little bit of a red herring in this. It's the third item on the uh, periodic table. It's a very, very common element. Yes. Most of it's dissolved in the oceans. But so when we mine it, usually it's coming out of dissolve, you know, evaporation flats, salt flats, uh, places it used to be a sea where it evaporated out. Um, I think that you're going to see if you go look, you know, they, we call them lithium ion batteries. So everybody focuses on the lithium. It's the cobalt, the nickel that's used in the batteries. It's the steel, the aluminum. Uh, you know, the bauxite for aluminum. Aluminum takes massive amounts of electricity to produce and bauxite mining. So I think we need to focus across the board. Um, I've had a lot of people scream at me about uh, cobalt and lithium, and they're carrying one of these around. <laughs> Which has both of those things in it. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's right. Thank, uh, thank you. And I, I, will, I read an article a, a couple of days ago about uh, the potential for refining lithium out of the detritus that comes out of a thermal uh, power plant. Um, because apparently uh, the salts that are, that are in the uh, very, very hot water that's coming out of uh, the ground when you use it for, to generate electricity using geothermal processes uh, are, is very rich in those, in those elements you were talking about. And, uh, and, and so there, there, there's, you know, there's exploration going on all the time to lower the cost of extracting these materials and reducing the, uh, the level of uh, uh, other effects on the environment in the process. Um, John uh, Daniels uh, asked, uh, is there a benefit to parking an EV in the garage instead of the driveway besides charging convenience? Um, I, I have to tell you that, that we have two electric vehicles. One parks on the driveway 
The other parks in the garage, as far as I can tell, there's no difference at all. But we live in a pretty mild climate. Um, anybody else have a thought about that one? I have, I have two thoughts. Um, one is uh, cold temperatures do have uh, some negative impact on battery life. So if it's winter, um, the car that's parked in the garage is probably going to get a little more range when you pull it out and, and head out than the one parked in the driveway. Um, there are ways to precondition the battery while it's plugged in, um, but it's a thought. Um, the second is simply, um, you know, the, the big benefit for uh, many of us is being able to charge at home. And you just wanna make sure that wherever you're parking your car and whatever kind of charging equipment you have, that the cord is going to be long enough to reach it. <laughs> and uh, so that you don't have to back in awkwardly or something like that. So it's, it's worth thinking that through a little bit, I suppose, is, is what I'm trying to say. And, uh, uh, and, you know, and just making sure um, when you buy that electric vehicle supply equipment that's advertised with cords of different lengths. And so um, if you're going to park your car outside the, the garage, but the equipment's mounted inside, you just want to make sure that that cable is going to be long enough to get all the way to where your the plug on your car is or the outlet on your car, inlet on your car is. And it's perfectly safe to plug out in the rain. But I have to tell you, as someone who's done both in and out, is there's a psychological impact to taking a big giant cord and plugging it in in the pouring rain while you're soaked and it's soaked. It works fine, never had a problem, but it, it, it does feel a little odd. Yeah, these connectors are built so that you can do that without danger of electrocuting yourself. Um, that would be one of the big drawbacks if they didn't build them that way, but they're all, all of those connectors are designed not to have a problem with water. Now, if you, if you submerge them, that would be different, but rain isn't gonna be a problem. Um, the, uh, uh, Bill Hayes has asked, uh, he says, we have uh, added solar to our house with a solar edge uh, inverter. We, we th I think we have a type one charger. Can, we ex can you explain the difference between one type one and type two charger? Can we convert my type one to a type two? Uh, I think, Bill, that, that uh, Charlie answered that question in his, uh, in his presentation, but I'd simply note that a level one charger is a standard outlet, and depending upon what kind of a cable you have with your car, you, in addition to actually installing uh, a, a 240 volt uh, uh, outlet or charger itself, uh, you may have to get a, a, an additional cable that actually is designed for a level two uh, charging system. Uh, Charlie or, or Mike, do you wanna add anything to that? I, I don't have anything to add. I, I kind of think that um, uh, my suspicion is that there's something about the solar edge inverter you're referring to that, that probably isn't relevant where it comes to the car. I, I, I assume it's a grid tied system since you said you added solar to your house. Um, and so it'll work just like we described during the presentation. You plug the car into an outlet, it's level one, you should be able, um, uh, you know, you, you uh, should be able to add a 240 volt plug, just again, straight from your house panel to be able to upgrade to a type two charger if you wanted to do that. It is uh, worth, in, in terms of installing those type two, char those level two chargers, um, it is worth consulting an electrician. Sometimes you, you find out your panel's maxed out and it turns out to be extra expensive to install that level two charger. Um, there are you know, a handful of other potential concerns too. It is something that an electrician, a qualified electrician needs to do for you. All right. Uh, there, there are several other questions that I think you answered in, in your presentation. But one of them that I'm not sure about, uh, John Daniels asks if there's a chance of uh, tax incentives changing for 2022. You already described that for the uh, Oregon because of the legislative action earlier in the year. Uh, but I'll simply note that the Build Back Better uh, bill that's in Congress right now would make significant changes to uh, uh, tax incentives at the federal level. Rather than trying to describe it, I think what I'd suggest is that People look it up if and when that bill passes. And of course, it probably won't apply until uh, certainly sometime in 2022. It's really, really late in the year to have it uh, apply for this, this year. 
Um, any other comments on that? On I would that? just say there there are uh, key people in Congress who are particularly uninterested in uh, supporting electric vehicle adoption. And so even if Build Back Better passes, it could be that the EV incentives won't be a part of it when it does. So um, I, you know, who, who knows? It might be worth hanging on to see if that comes through. Um, but I, I'm not sure that I would organize my life around Congress doing anything in particular. Right. Not that and I, I completely agree with that. I've been following it pretty closely. Uh, Peter DeFazio, our congressman, of course, has been very, very instrumental in passing the big infrastructure bill that just passed and also working on this. And, and uh, he's not talking much right now because they're busy trying to get the, the bill passed uh, at this time. So we really don't know. Um, the next question, really interesting one, Lefty uh, asks, uh, will uh, utilities be upscaling their electric grid capacity to allow the transfer to electric vehicles? And I would, I would start with that one simply by saying Eugene Water and Electric Board has done a study and they're convinced that if people charge at night and uh, when uh, other, other electric demand is low, um, and of course it's easy to do that if you have a, a, a plug-in at home that you use because you just set the car so that it doesn't start until after 10 o'clock at night and, and, and finishes up uh, sometime early in the morning. Um, if you do that, uh, they don't need to do any change to their uh, to their delivery system, the electric grid. Uh, the, the, the EV charging, they can charge every car if they change to electricity tomorrow, so long as you're willing to do most of your charging at night. Um, anything to add uh, to that? Now, I, I also believe that the same consideration applies to all of the other electric uh, uh, utilities as well. Because their main draws are, are dinner time, four o'clock to about 10 o'clock in the evening uh, at home, and then uh, for industrial use uh, during the day. At night, night tends to be a low demand time. And so if you can charge then, you don't, there's not going to be any requirement for upgrading the grid just for electric vehicle charging. Um, I would just say, I, I think it depends somewhat on where in the country you are. Right, but the, we're talking about the, here. The, yeah, the local here. utilities seem very unconcerned. And, yeah. and I think what you'll see them doing is, is uh, you know, rolling out incentives for charging at, at low usage times um, so that you will find it's much cheaper to fill your electric vehicle tank um, in the middle of the night than it is during the day. During the day. Yeah, California already has time of use charging, uh, which it works exactly the way you described it. Charge per kilowatt hour in the middle of the night is a lot lower than the charge uh, during the peak times. And, and uh, several of the utilities are exploring that, doing that here. So if you use power in the middle of the night, you pay less for it. Uh, the the uh, next one is from Craig, who says he currently has a 2003 Subaru Forester and wants to replace it with a battery EV in 2022 or 2023. He drives his Forester to snow parks near Willamette Pass and Santa Ann Pass to cross-country ski. He also uses it to pull a utility trailer short distances when working on projects in the yard and with maybe a 1,500 pound load. The upcoming Subaru uh, Solterra is a very interesting, but I'm concerned that the announced 220 mile range implies a smaller battery than I would want for driving into the Cascade in the winter. Comments? Also, have you seen regarding low tow rate ratings for EVs? Thanks. Any, either, either of you want to talk about those two issues? Uh, driving into the mountains with, uh, with a, you know, with a 220 mile range vehicle and, uh, and also uh, towing a 1500 pound load on the trailer. Well, first is I would discount your range by probably about 25% for driving in the mountains. Uh, battery vehicles can have a little bit more loss in the cold. Uh, part of that's just because you're using energy to heat your cabin. Um, you're dealing with the mountains. Although when you come down the mountain, you get some of that energy back from regenerative braking. Uh, but generally in extremely cold weather, I, I just kind of mentally cut my range by about 25%. So I don't know how that would work for you. Um, 
EVs that tow generally have a very high towing capacity because EVs have very high torque. In fact, the first hybrid out there was the uh, diesel locomotive, which actually uses the diesel to run a generator to use electric motors for the torque. Right, for the rail on the railroad. Yeah, and it's of course it's not possible to draw to draw, draw a unit train, uh, a hundred car train, without using electric motors uh, to, to uh, for the torque to get that uh, locomotive moving. You're absolutely right. Um, I would note, I would add to that that uh, that range tends to decline when you add anything that's not aerodynamic on the back of your of your vehicle. Uh, you're you're going to uh, cross country at Willamette Pass. It's about what is it, about 60 miles from Eugene, um, you could probably get back to your driveway in Eugene, but it would be close with that 220 mile range car, especially if you're towing a trailer up there. I'll, I'll add the, 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 uh, just a few things. One is, you know, you'll be a real pioneer in this area for doing what you're describing. There are not many people doing what you're talking about doing with EVs. And we'll all be curious to hear how it goes. Um, and uh, I, I'm a little, uh, Mike's very conservative on his estimate for uh, winter range loss. I, I don't generally see that much loss in uh, winter. And I do find when driving in the mountains, you get really worried going uphill because your range is declining so so fast. And then you turn around and come downhill and it's like, you know, suddenly your car has more range than, than you, you thought you had. And, and uh, because it recalibrates the, your remaining range, you know, the car's all come uh, just to alleviate your range anxiety with an estimate based on how you're driving, how much range you have left. And so you, you have this continuous readout of how far you can go whenever you're driving an EV. Um, and uh, watching those numbers go back up coming down a, a mountain is really fun. Um, the, uh, uh, the, um, both a good and a bad thing about electric cars, it's, it's, uh, Bad that there's still not a, a bajillion models available, but in your particular instance, it's good because you don't have too many to filter through to find a car that'll meet your needs. The number of all-wheel drive vehicles with a tow rating and that are EVs is probably on the order of like six, um, and uh, you can probably you can look at all of them and see what they think. They're more coming all the time. But, you know, you're probably looking at like the Tesla Model Y immediately jumps to my mind as to what you need. They, you know, they're they offer they'll install your tow hitch uh, at the factory uh, that'll show up ready to go. Um, you can get a Model Y with over 300 miles of range, which is certainly going to get you to Willamette Pass and back even in winter and towing something. Um, but, uh, you know, it'd be worth checking. I don't know. I believe they're offering all wheel drive models of, uh, things like the Ford Mustang Mach-E, uh, the, um, up the Bolt EUV, the, the newer SUV class vehicle. I'm not sure about the Volkswagen ID4, but I sort of suspect that it would have, it would have something. I'm also not sure about the Kia Nero, which is a, uh, kind of uh, maybe the closest car to your Subaru that's out there right now, but I don't know if it has a tow rating and it also only has about 250 so miles of range. Right. You, you know, um, when we're getting to very specific questions, the next one is on the same topic. What's the best EV to tow a camper up to 5,000 pounds? Uh, my recommendation is that you do some research, uh, read some of the articles on the uh, on the vehicles you're looking at, and uh, and uh, uh, be prepared to uh, to actually do some study in in order to figure it out. I, I would recommend people go, for example, to to a website called cleantechnica.com, spelled just like it sounds, all one word, cleantechnica.com. You might add that Charlie to your email later, and and look and look up uh, 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 towing camper towing uh, with electric vehicles because. There's more, there's more coming out all the time with more capacity. And a lot of it depends on what you need too. Um, uh, if, if you're gonna have, an, for example, suppose you're a carpenter or, or a plumber or an electrician and you, you need an electric, you need a pickup truck. The new pickup trucks are gonna be fabulous for people who are doing that kind of work, but you also can add a trailer hitch and, and tow that uh, camper with that vehicle. Um, depending upon how many people you plan to carry along with you, uh, you either need a, a, a one bench or a two bench uh, cab, 
And you're, you're just going to have to do some research to figure out what one, what works. I, I should add, when you're focusing in on a particular vehicle, it's worth uh, hunting up. They're usually uh, user groups out there in the yeah. internet other that have long and extensive discussions about what they've done with their vehicles. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've actually done winter driving research that way myself, where um, I, I've looked up my user groups for my vehicle. And you can get a lot of great information just based on people's real world experiences. What happened when I took my Tesla Model Y and tried to haul a trailer with snow machines up to the mountains and and you know someone someone somewhere has done that even though like i say you're likely to be a pioneer here the dream for ev campers which you see like starting now to appear in prototypes are campers that have are, are built on a chassis with their own battery pack in them so that they provide extra charge um, uh, to make up for the fact you're hauling this really heavy thing, you also have like all this extra energy on board that you can use to help you go. But that's an industry in its infancy right now. It's just starting, right. Marjorie uh, asks a really important question. For Pacific Power Utility customers in Corvallis, over half of the electricity is produced by coal plants in Wyoming and Utah. And that's absolutely true. So using renewable produ uh, produced electricity is quite important. And of course, Marjorie's right about that. Uh, the Oregon legislature has been after Pacific Power and uh, uh, Portland General Electric, PGE, for some time to get rid of their uh, coal-fired power plants and also their gas-fired uh, systems. The legislature this last year passed a bill that is, uh, that is going to require a very, uh, an end, uh, and I think the year is 2040. I'm not certain that I have that right. But I think the year is 2040 that they will have to have finally phased out all of the fossil fuel electricity uh, in the Northwest grid in Oregon. Uh, so that number of 109 that you saw on, on one of Charlie's uh, uh, slides will go to infinite uh, because there won't be any uh, coal. But you're absolutely right. Right now, Wyoming and Utah are involved in it. Some of those plants in Wyoming are already closing. There are 12 in one complex and about half of them have already closed because Pacific Power and other people who are using this energy have found other ways to, to generate it that are less polluting or not polluting at all. I think it's a great question. Do you want to add anything to that, Charlie or Mike? How long does it, okay, uh, uh, Mitra asks, how long does it take to charge an EV at a station on a road trip? I think you've already dealt with that question, but do you want to add anything to that? I did, I will, I will just add this, that it, um, uh, you do want to be aware of um, how how big a charge your car can take and where the stations are that can deliver that maximum charge. This is something that you do have to think about a little bit more if this if if this is a real concern for you um, going forward. And um, there is an additional app called Chargeway. Uh, that like PlugShare identifies where charging equipment is available. It does a great job of showing which uh, chargers, which DC fast chargers are actually best suited for your car. Right. And um, I will include information about Chargeway in the mailing I send out too, so that you're aware of that is it, they don't have a, well, they have a website, but they don't have their information on their website. It's really only available as a phone app. Um, and, uh, but, you know, Ideally, you should be able to get to an 80% charge in, I'd say, 40 minutes or less. And the reason I say 80% charge is because there's, and here I, I get out of, out of my depth in terms of physics, but that last 20%, um, the charging unit will gradually slow down. It is harder to fill that last 20% of capacity, and so it takes a lot longer. And so while it may take you 40 minutes to get to 80% charge, it may take you an hour and 20 minutes to get to full charge. Um, and uh, Mike looks like he might be able to explain the mechanics of that. Well, I was going to say, uh, we drove our Model 3 to Chicago and then took Route 66 down to Albuquerque, took a right turn and came back up here. And most EVs, I have a Tesla, but most EVs know where the charge stations are or you use an app like uh, Charlie was talking about. So the, the real difference in the mindset is just that instead of waiting till you're low on fuel and looking for a fueling station, 
when you're fueling up, you look and see where you're going to stop next if you're on a trip. So we would just look, tell the car, the car knows right on the map where all the stations are. You just pick the one you're going to. And then as you're charging up, it literally has right on the screen what your battery will be at when you get to the new location. The next so charge. I charge until I had uh, 20% extra and then head on out. Um, and yeah, you can, you can get really fast charging when your battery is almost empty and then it slows down as it fills up. So we would typical charge to 60 or 80%. Um, and, uh, typically, so we would leave the hotel in the morning at lunchtime, we would charge if there was a, if we were eating at the charger, you know, a restaurant near the charger, we would just let it charge. However, uh, you know, probably full cause we'd be in the restaurant for an hour. Um, and then we'd stop at three o'clock. Usually the three to four o'clock stop for fuel only took 20 minutes to, to half an hour and then charge overnight uh, at the hotel. If the hotel had a charger, which most of them did, or I would just, my, I would drop everybody off and I would just go to the supercharger in town and, and get a little bit of peace and quiet while I charged it up for the next day. Right. You know, one of the things to be aware of when you're thinking about this is, if, if you're a traveling salesman and you're out on the road all the time, these kinds of questions are really critical to you because every minute you're stopped past the time it takes to use the facilities and get another cup of coffee is really important to you. If you're like most of us and you go to visit Aunt Tilly in Los Angeles once a year, this stuff almost doesn't matter. You have to understand the basics of it, but the fact that if it takes 10 minutes more, uh, it, it won't matter because you're only doing it once a year. And the rest of the time, it takes 20 seconds to charge, 10 seconds to plug in and 10 seconds to unplug because the, all the actual charge time is when you're doing something else at home. Um, but it, it, for, the, for the person who drives a lot, this, is the, this, is, this kind of question is really important. The other thing Charlie said earlier, which I think is really valuable is that You'll get into the rhythm of this on a trip really fast. And what Mike described is exactly what people who drive electric cars do. You don't try to charge to 100%. You try to charge enough so that uh, you use the, the sweet spot for the battery when it can charge the fastest. That gets you, that gets you with a safety margin to your next charger. Um, Phil, if I could uh, break in and just uh, say real quickly here that we've gotten to 815 already. Oh this group is, a, is amazing. These are really excellent questions and we're trying to answer them as thoroughly as possible, but I don't want everyone to feel like you have to remain on this call. We're going to stay here longer and get through as many and hopefully all of these questions, um, as many as we can and hopefully all of them. But if you need to drop off, uh, feel free to do that. We'll kind of officially wind the program here. And I just want to let you know a couple of things before you go, if you're going. Uh, one is you will be getting a, a, a follow-up email with some additional resources and information tomorrow. Um, it'll come from uh, revup at evEVA.org. So check your spam if it doesn't show up anywhere else. Um, and um, there also, I saw an inquiry about whether this recording will be available. We always keep a semi-current recording um, on our website at evEVA.org. Um, and so you can go there, go to uh, the Rev Up page, and you will find at the bottom of that page a uh, uh, posted recording. This one's actually been, uh, in part because of the wonderful quality of the questions that have been here, it's been a really good session. And we might well uh, turn this into the current version of the recording um, in the near future. That'll probably take us a week or two to get this exact one up there. But there's a, a recording of something very similar to this there now. And I really appreciate everyone uh, being here. And um, the questions don't have to stop here. Uh, we will see in that email, you'll be a couple of possibilities for getting further um, answers if you need them. Um, one I'll highlight is that EVVA, the Emerald Valley Electric Vehicle Association, which the three of us are associated with, has an ask an owner service where if you have a question about a specific car or just about EVs in general or about installing a charging station, you can write ask an owner at evEVA.org and we'll try to find a local EV owner who has some experience with what you're asking about, whether it's the particular car um, or anything else and set them up to chat with you um, and hopefully get further questions answered. And so 
Um, thanks again for coming and, and again, feel free to drop off if you need to, but we'll, we'll keep working our way through this list. We got an awful lot of people here. We still, we still have uh, quite a few questions. The, the next one is, uh, will auto insurance for EVs be more? I think the simple answer is uh, do your work, investigate, and the answer generally is no. I, and I think that over time, as the auto insurance industry gets more and more accustomed to EVs, I put up that slide about uh, uh, loss, loss claims. Um, and right now, EVs are less expensive for insurance companies than conventional cars. So, um, you know, if the world were just, uh, right now, you would be paying less for auto insurance for EV. I don't think the world is that just just yet. And I think auto insurance companies are still worried, but um, it, it's worth it's worth asking. I, I did not notice my rates going up particularly much by going to an EV, but it probably varies by insurance company and uh, uh, and the particular car that you have. No, that's right. yeah, we had to abandon the company we'd been with for life. You just got to shop around. And now I'm paying the same for our Model 3s as we were playing, paying uh, for a Honda Civic. So uh, if you shop around, no, you don't have to pay more. Right. Uh, Lefty asks, uh, have charging plug adapters been produced that anyone can buy? Um, I, I happen to know that you can buy pretty much any charging adapters on, on uh, websites like Best Buy or Amazon or, or one of the uh, auto uh, uh, parts supply houses. Uh, anybody else have thoughts about that one? Well, an EVSE isn't just a plug. It's it's a device that communicates with your car. Yeah, he's asking about with, adapters. Yeah. Um, uh, if you wanted to plug a, uh, a Tesla into a Chatamo charger, for instance, and Tesla definitely has produced some of those, or not Tesla, but third parties have produced some of those plugs. Um, I don't think you'll find a plug that would allow you to plug your regular car into a Tesla charging station or a, or a, or a different yeah. model. A Tesla. Actually, there, there are some available. Well, 50 there. Yeah, okay. they, they only work on level two charging. So if you wanted to use a destination charger at a hotel that was designed for a Tesla, you could get a, an adapter on Amazon, for example, right now okay. for about $160, I think, that would allow you to plug your... J1772, the standard uh, level two connector that all of the other electric cars have into the Tesla charger. Uh, but, but they don't have one for the fast charger yet. Uh, but fast chargers are getting built uh, by Electrify America and a bunch of other people. Uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, the uh, bill that uh, uh, Peter DeFazio sponsored, the, the big infrastructure bill, has money to add a lot more. So. That's that's coming. What's the cost of putting an, in an EVSE charger in a home? Well, this is a fun one, Charlie or Mike. I, I'll just say that we we've we've been throwing out the number a thousand dollars, with the variation being huge on either side. So. Um, you know, if you already have a 240 volt outlet to run an electric dryer in your garage, it may just be the cost of the EVSE itself that if you find one that will plug into that, you might be able to get one for 300 bucks and plug it in and be done. If your car, if your house needs an electric panel upgrade to hold that, this extra 240 volt outlet, it could be quite a lot more than a thousand dollars. So unfortunately, it just depends. But roughly, you know, five hundred dollars for the unit, roughly five hundred dollars for an electrician to come wire it for you, but uh, with big variability on either right. side of that. If you have a a, a, a cable that plugs into your car that takes 240 volts, level two charging cable. Uh, you can use simply a, a simple outlet too that's designed to fit your, your plug-in. Uh, when I uh, installed my first uh, a charger, as it were, it cost $100 total, including the 15 bucks for the NEMA 1450 uh, connector because the, uh, the electrical panels in the garage, and the conduit was four inches long. It, it, it all depends on what you've got and what you, how much cable you have to run. Should also add that virtually all of the uh, utilities in the Eugene area, at least in Central Lane County, will offer you some kind of a rebate for to uh, help install uh, an electric vehicle charger. 
you'll want to investigate with your utility to figure that out. Hey, Phil, there's a question we bypassed here that I just wanted to oh. uh, make sure we touched on, which uh, from Judy asking about, um, is Resource there a list. List for mechanics that will work on EVs? Because yeah. uh, I think that's an important one. And, Go for it. And um, so for parts of the car that aren't related to the electric drive system, you know, if you're trying to get your tires aligned or you've got a suspension issue, um, you know, any mechanic can still work on that. If you have a problem with the, and there are very few problems that come up with these EV systems. I mean, they're really, the maintenance on EVs is remarkably slight, but if you were to have a problem, you're probably stuck with your dealership um, to fix that. Um, you know, I don't know that, you know, the EVs could spell the end, it was coming anyway, even, even from the major manufacturers, but the independent auto mechanic is, getting, holding on increasingly, uh, 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 or I guess it's becoming increasingly hard for the independent mechanic to work on modern cars, whether they're gas powered or EVs, but EVs may, may be the death knell for a lot of them, I'm afraid, because it's just very hard to work on some of this stuff as an independent mechanic. But right now in particular, um, uh, you know, if you have a problem with the actual electric system that makes the car go, you're probably dealing with your dealer. There are right to repair laws in almost every state. There is one in Oregon. The time will come when uh, a, uh, an independent repair person will be able to uh, force a manufacturer to sell them the software and the equipment needed to make these, the kind of repairs you're talking about. That hasn't come yet. There aren't enough of these cars out there for anybody else to want to, to do the training and the, and the big upgrade and learning to do it. You can still make your money on maintaining a, a gasoline or diesel powered engine, uh, changing the oil and doing all the other things that EVs don't have uh, because there's so many more ICE vehicles still available. But that's going to change over time because of the right to repair laws that we already have on the books. I would note that uh, uh, well, I think we've already answered uh, Karen's uh, question about uh, carbon emissions associated with EV production or, or manufacture. Um, and then, but Kathleen, I have a great answer for Kathleen. She says, I don't have an actual garage. How does it work for charging? There is an outside plug right where I park. And Kathleen, if you drive less than 30 miles a day, uh, typically, great news for you. Use the plug-in you've already got and you're done. There's a, there's a guy who works for SEMA Connect, which sells level two charging equipment that says that he, um, you know, he doesn't even like selling them to homeowners because he feels like most people will be just fine with their regular outlet. Um, and, uh, you know, having a level two charger in your house adds some flexibility, but really for your day-to-day -day driving, that just standard 110 outlet is yeah. uh, 20 yeah. outlets going to be fine. And let me just add just a, a comment about the planning that goes into thinking about this stuff. You have a car that gets 200 miles of range and, and uh, you know, over a period of a week, you charge it all pretty much all the way up and, and you drive, uh, you drive to uh, Salem from Eugene, 70 miles, and you drive back to Eugene, that's 140 miles, and you're going to drive 15 miles to work tomorrow. So you plug it in overnight, it adds uh, 30 miles uh, to the to the, uh, the uh, 60 miles of range you have left overnight, and you drive 15 miles. And you come back, and now you have 45 miles, uh, no, uh, whatever the number is, 75 miles of range on your car when you park it, and you add 30 miles of range. By the end of the week, you will have made up all of the electricity you used to get to Salem and back on that one trip. And that was typically what I did when I was driving to the legislature on a regular basis. So even a standard outlet, uh, uh, if you have enough capacity in your battery in the first place, a standard outlet may be all you'll ever need. Uh, and when you're out on the road uh, going distances, you want a car that, that will do DC fast charging so that you can charge up quickly in, in, in the way Mike was describing earlier. Um, you want to add anything to that? 
Uh, Larry uh, says, uh, I want to add another year. I want to wait another year or two to buy an EV. Will there likely be more better options? Oh, yes. <laughs> We're, yes, they're coming. Watch for them. Um, I want to get, uh, Aaron says, I want to get an electric for my commute. But oh, and Phil, if I could just add one more thing on um, what you just said, which is just that, um, you know, I, I think in particular, like a lot of the cars that have been commonly available for now have been sort of on the class of, Chevrolet Bolt, Nissan Leaf, Kia Nero, Hyundai Kona, you know, they've been basic sort of four person sedan hatchbacks, all the, you know, many of the Teslas. Um, so what we're about to see the, what we're really seeing a lot of coming our way now are some of the more SUV class vehicles, the pickup trucks, in addition to some more differentiation um, in those smaller vehicles. But um, uh, you know, it sometimes seems agonizingly slow, like the, the manufacturers promised them. And then particularly with uh, COVID and the supply chain issues, a lot of the arrival dates have been pushed back, like the Nissan Aria, which is kind of an SUV class vehicle, looks beautiful. Um, you know, have no idea when it's going to show up. Uh, the dealer doesn't have any idea when it's going to show up, which I know because I stopped and asked recently. Um, the um, the Tesla Cybertruck, uh, which Tesla is known for its delays and in, in, in meeting its promised dates, but the it's been it's been going on forever in terms of when they've been promising it. So. Um, uh, it's hard to know exactly when a lot of these new cars are going to show up, but they they are coming. And and the Volkswagen ID4 came out this year, and we see a lot of them driving around town now. The Ford Mustang Mach E uh, just this year, you know, which are two cars that there really wasn't anything anything like them uh, until this year. And that will, you know, we'll probably see at least I'd say two or three or four new models a year uh, every year going forward. I think one of the best advice that I can give is if you have a car that works now, that gets you where you need to go and does the things you need that you really have to do, uh, even if it's a gasoline powered gas guzzler, I would hang on to it uh, until you get the, until the electric car that you want uh, becomes available. Um, whatever, but whatever you do, do not buy a new gasoline powered car. The likelihood of you ever getting your used car money out of it uh, in five or eight or 10 years is very, very small because by that time, the market will have turned over completely and nobody will want your old uh, gasoline powered car. When I say that, a lot of people shake their heads, but I am convinced that that is, uh, that that is true. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a, that's a really important thing. Um, uh, Okay, so uh, Aaron has a long comment. Did, is there anything in there that we haven't already talked about? Yeah, I, had, I wanted to speak to Aaron for a second because I ran a, uh, an office equipment company, I owned one for 25 years, and I, I know where he's coming from on the manufacturers keeping you from doing what you need to do. Um, you know, they're, they're just, you know, we got to fight for our... Uh, our right to repair. But in the meantime, if I were you, I would see if you can get a hold of, uh, there's a YouTuber, Rich Rebuilds is the name of his site. Um, he does an EV repair garage and he may be able to point you in the right direction if he's uh, not too big. Um, and then also, wouldn't you think, Phil, that Platt uh, up in Portland might have some advice for him as far oh. as service? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Platt knows a lot about this stuff. If you're interested in getting into the business, uh, repairing electric vehicles, I would definitely talk to him and ask him who else you should talk to, um, Aaron. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, you only need one good contact who can give you three names and, and you're in business. Um, uh, I, okay, well, I think we've answered Leslie's question about where to find a good used EV. Uh, a lot of the auto dealers uh, are starting to get them but uh, I would definitely check in with Platt on what they've got available and see if uh, what they have uh, would be useful to you. And Charlie's going to send you the link to that. Mm -hmm. um, why was the Volt discontinued? Is the Volt still being made? Uh, uh, shrug, shrug and, and nobody knows why the Volt was discontinued. The Volt worked like the uh, diesel electric locomotive in that the motor, the engine was only used to charge the battery. It wasn't actually part of the drive system that was run by uh, by an electric motor. 
But I don't think anybody really knows why the vault was discontinued. Do, do we know? I loved my vaults. I had two of them over the years. And I think it's just that the thing was dramatically over-engineered and GM was losing money on every one they sold. Yeah. So they, it was a test. It was just to, it was just cause they, you know, uh, oh, what's his name? Barra saw the, uh, the uh, Tesla Roadster in 2004 or five when they revealed it. And he said, we can do that. So they, uh, they just, they're idiots really. It's GM. Yeah, and the Bolt is still being made, and there's no reason to believe it won't be, but right now what they're doing is they're retrofitting uh, the existing bolts with new, with new or, or, or rebuilt batteries to deal with the fire hazard that, that everybody knows about. Uh, the, uh, the company that made the battery has acknowledged that uh, it screwed up, and it's actually paying for most of the cost of that, of that re redo, but uh, I don't believe that the Bolt is actually being made now. If you want one and you can get a used one, I would recommend you take a look at it. Um, but be aware that you may have to uh, have it available for a battery replacement if that hasn't already been done. Um, we got a comment from Mark that Think Electric installs home chargers, and then he gives a price there. So that's a, a, another option. Um, uh, John Fowler says that the recall for the bolt hit, and now we're waiting for the bolt to come back into availability. Uh, and, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about, uh, about Tesla and how far behind they are in actually predicting when their cars are gonna come out. And so it's not just Elon time, it's also General Motors and Ford time when it comes to when these things are gonna be available. Does either, do either of you have heard anything about when the, Bolt is going to be back in the in the lot for sale. I, I just know that the they you know the uh, their Korean battery supplier is now churning out the batteries, uh, the replacement batteries, so they can do all the warranty repairs, and presumably some of those will be going into new vehicles too. Um, I haven't heard anything specifically about when they'll be available for sale again, but at least the problem's been addressed, and now it's just all right getting them manufactured and back out there. And they have this whole new one, the Bolt EUV that's uh, right. waiting in the wings. Uh, right, and, it, and it, it's, it is in manufacture, isn't it? Maybe not. No, I think it is, uh, but I, I mean, I, I, I don't know where on the production shipping right. process it is. You, you, can't, you can't go to the local Chevrolet and buy one as far as I know. I thought they were building all those at Hamtrak and it's shut down right now. Yes, that's right. The batteries. Yeah. Um, Rebecca, I see all the batteries that are being made for the Bolt are going into replacements for the ones that already are out in the world. And so they don't have any batteries for, the, for new Bolts, and so they're not making any right now. Um, so when, when purchasing a used EV, so asks Rebecca, what issues need to be considered to buy a reliable used EV? Um, I, I, I would say the, the most important thing is to make sure that the battery uh, is, uh, is uh, working correctly and is likely to have significant life left in it. I would definitely ask uh, a mechanic who understands the uh, electric vehicles uh, to look at that. But then of course the other parts of the car, tires, brake systems, suspension, uh, and anything else, Audit could be looked at by pretty much any mechanic who understands uh, cars uh, to give you an idea of whether the car is uh, workable. And one of the things I would be doing if I were looking at a, a used EV is, is that, and I might actually ask Mr. Platt in Portland what he thinks are the key issues that you should look for. Um, anything you to add to that one? Um, there's a comment that there's a lot of lithium in the deserts of Southern California and Afghanistan, and in fact, all over. Uh, <laughs> parking outside in the car park. If you can't reach the power plug in a garage, get a hefty extension cord. I have to say that I'm not, a, I'm not an electrician, but I would recommend against using extension cords. Um, you really need to put your, your uh, EVSC, your, uh, your charger, in a place where you can use the cord that came with it to plug directly into the car. It's just a whole lot safer that way. 
I want to second that with experience. I My Volt couldn't quite reach the outlet in the house or on the outside of the house. So I had to use a short extension cord. And I used a very heavy one. And uh, over six years of owning Volts, I did burn up a cord. I mean, it wasn't like a fire danger, but it just, the whole thing started coiling like a spring uh, from all the heat. So you, you got to remember you're pulling 12 amps continuously for like 10, 12 hours. Right. That, that, so that's a really important item. I, I would not jerry rig uh, an electric vehicle charger, except in that very rare situation where you're trying to use somebody else's uh, uh, welder plug in in the outback someplace uh, and then get him to help you figure out how to do it. Uh, and be aware that, that you know, you might have to unplug it in a real hurry because it, the wire is getting hot. Um, uh, Doug Black asks if recording will be available. The answer is yeah, uh, there, there will be a recording uh, uh, of this one and we post about every other one. I don't know whether we're posting this one or not, but uh, we'll certainly look at it. But there, there are already recordings on, on the YouTube in our channel uh, on, uh, uh, to watch if you want to see it again. Which you can also just access through our website, evEVA.org. Right, and that's where you that's why your excise, access it is evEVA.org, and then and then uh, uh, look for events, and it'll be posted there. Uh, will Arkimoto adopt their design so that a motorcycle trailer can be towed to Costco? That's a great question for Mark Fronmeyer, who is the owner. I think you ought to ask him, Lefty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's in town. He's easy to find. Uh, we got thanks for the for an interesting presentation. Um, uh, thanks, Charlie. Yeah, you're doing great, Charlie. Uh, uh, and then the final comment is about the making stop making volts or volts. Uh, and and uh, uh, we we're done. 